pardon me just a moment. The question came up or the comment that was made was um, the role of the Federal Reserve and whether or not the Federal Reserve's actions after 2008 and again now, um, more or less priming the economy, priming the pump um, with expansive monetary and fiscal policy action, whether that would be something that would lead to a bubble um, or has led to a bubble. Um, and I wanted to just talk about that for a moment. Um, this slide that we're looking at here shows um, what the unemployment rate was and what wage growth was um, from the Great Recession to the beginning of this COVID-driven recession in 2020. Um, and you see that the unemployment rate soared to just about over 10%. Naturally, that's the U3 number, not the U6 number, which was much higher, close to 17 or 18 percent for people that had dropped out of the labor market after the Great Recession. But what do you see? You see a couple of things going on in this slide. You see the, the unemployment rate soaring during the Great Recession and then coming down dramatically over the course of the ensuing years. Um, and we know the reason for that. We know that a key reason for that is because of the efforts being made by the Federal Reserve to prime the economy to expand its balance sheet buying uh, $4.5 trillion worth of mortgage-backed and treasury securities over the period of a number of um, uh, 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 um, just about four years um, in order to keep interest rates low, to encourage um, investors and consumers to um, borrow and spend um, and invest. Um, and so the evidence is overwhelming that the trade-off that was argued under the Phillips curve, that lower unemployment is going to mean higher inflation and has given fuel to the argument by some people who say that the government should spend less, not more, should um, uh, pursue, um, uh, um, uh, should pursue spending that uh, is less aggressive, for example, rather than a $2 trillion plan. The suggestion was, the, the suggestion from the, um, uh, the, the suggestion from the other side of the aisle was, uh, so to speak, one party said a $2 trillion plan that's being passed. Another party said we should issue a plan that's a third of that, 600 billion, um, which would do a fraction what the larger plan is uh, expected to accomplish in terms of helping to rescue um, an economy that is suffering and millions of people that are um, on the brink of either homelessness or starvation. So um, uh, there's overwhelming evidence that there is not that trade-off that's been, that's been argued for for many years with regard to um, a trade-off between uh, lower unemployment and higher inflation. And we see evidence of that here. What we also see going on here is that wage growth was relatively small. Right now, it's just about 2%. Um, during this period, between uh, the beginning of the Great Recession till the end, the overall uh, wage growth is about just under 3%. Um, we've all looked at slides of the growth of the Dow during the same time, which the majority of the stock in the Dow is held by a relatively small group of people. It's, it's claimed that it's, it's about 10% of the people own about 80, 85% of all the stocks. Most people that are exposed to the stock market are exposed to it, their 401ks, their pension plans. Um, so there's a small group of people that are enormous, that own an enormous amount of stock um, and only 50% of the country um, is exposed to the stock market. As I said, most, most of those people to their pension plan. So whereas we've seen a huge growth in wealth among the top, we've seen a, an, a, a, a contraction in net worth for the bottom 50%. And we've talked about that when we've discussed um, income inequality. Getting back to the Fed though, and the role of the Fed and what the Fed should or shouldn't have done, I thought it'd be interesting to um, highlight for you a couple of things. Um, at the end of 2013, the Fed's balance sheet had expanded to $4.5 trillion having bought treasury and mortgage-backed securities to accomplish the objectives we've talked about, keeping rates low and stimulate buying, um, uh, borrowing, uh, investing, and spending. Um, beginning in 2014, in January 2014, the Fed reduced its, reduced its monthly buying program from $75 billion to $65 billion. Does anyone know what that process is called when the Fed incrementally reduces the amount of money that it's pumping into the economy? Pardon me there? Is it quantum uh, tensioning or something like that? Uh, no, quantitative easing is what they're doing when they're no. buying. It's called tapering. They're tapering. They're incrementally reducing their um, monthly purchases. Why not just stop? 
Well, if they stop too quickly, what's that likely to do to the economy? It's likely to turn the economy into what? A recession. If it waits too long, then what's the fear? The fear is, as you was pointed out, it might've been you, Andrew, yesterday on Monday, um, that um, you could have ensuing inflation. So there's a balance that the Fed has to make in terms of short-term and long-term expectations. By May 2019, so in the third quarter of 2019, the monthly purchases by the Fed had fallen to $15 billion. So from 75 in 2014 to 65, then to 15. Does anybody know what the monthly purchases are now in light of the efforts the Fed is making to um, uh, uh, stimulate demand and to stabilize output? What their monthly purchases are now? Obviously, they've soared because of um, the, uh, the crisis we found ourselves in. Does anybody know what the number is? Unlimited, isn't it? Well, no, they've recently had their, what was it, a, a, a week or so ago that uh, uh, there was a, a conference with Jerome Powell. I know that I am among many of you, we, we watched it, we talked about it. Right now, the Fed's buying $120 billion worth of treasury and mortgage-backed securities a month, okay? And when it becomes clear that the economy is self-sustaining at some point in the future, um, we've got um, a, a better control over this pandemic. Um, which looks likely to happen sometime in the not too distant future, then of course the Fed has made clear that it's going to begin considering uh, to taper. Um, but I just wanted to uh, address the point of what the Fed's, in, in terms of the Fed and its quantitative easing efforts and how tapering figures into them meeting their longer term, of, their short and long term objectives. Are there any questions on this? No? Okay. So, now, let's take a look at the numbers today. Uh, we, we had numbers on Monday and today. We had manufacturing numbers. We have, if you see here, Manufacturing Purchaser Managing Index, which is the PMI number, and we had the Institute for Supply Managers Manufacturing Index. Um, today, we had the, um, with regard to this, we had the Purchasing Managers Index from the Services Industry, and we had the Institute for Supply Managers Services Index. These are very important figures. These are measures, these measures are barometer for economic trends in the manufacturing and service sector. And they come out monthly and they're incredibly important. Each represent a survey of just over 400 purchasing managers and supply managers. Any reading over 50% signals an expansion in the economy. And you see that I've underlined four numbers here. All of these numbers are over 50 and would suggest an expansion in the economy. What was the headline? The headline was, Manufacturers grow at the fastest pace since the pandemic began. The businesses are more optimistic. Orders are increasing in anticipation of strong sales with vaccines plus a $2 trillion government stimulus, which is exactly what we've been saying. And so in these forward looking numbers for the purchasing managers, the numbers are telling us what we'd expect them to tell us. That with an expectation of um, uh, um, aggressive vaccinations and aggressive fiscal and monetary policy action to um, support the economy, um, the likelihood is, is that there's a lot of pent up demand that is going to be released um, relatively soon. And therefore, purchasing managers and supply managers are gearing up for that. Um, and the numbers support that, um, that we got on Monday and Wednesday uh, in the manufacturing and services sector. <laughs> Pardon me. One of the, one of the um, caveats here, though, is that the services index here at 55.3 is at a nine month low. Getting back to the comment that Guy made before with regard to retail and that I expanded on a bit about services, why would we not be surprised that the services index is particularly low or at a nine month low? Hotels, movie theaters, retail stores, how do those sectors look right now across America? Not good. Heavily, not good. Uh, That's uh, right. Uh, Why? Because bankruptcy. they look not good because the service side of the economy has been hit really hard. That's why the ADP unemployment number is lower than, ex that, well, that's one of the reasons why ADP employment is low. But in terms of the services sector, the services sector has been particularly hard, hit particularly hard. And the expectation, again, is that with vaccines and continued support from the government, um, 
uh, the services sector should recover. One of the reasons why we're seeing a rotation of uh, funds, money, out of the tech sector into the services and retail sector, as uh, uh, Guy and Andrew were pointing out before. Um, uh, now let's turn our attention to the ADP number, which is the employment report that looks at the private sector unemployment um, for the month. Uh, this precedes the number on Friday we'll get, which is the um, non-farm payroll number, the critical number on Friday non-farm payrolls. Um, what did this show? The expectation of us is that we would we would show an increase of 117,000, uh, an increase of 225,000. We ended up with 117. And what was the headline? U.S. private payrolls increase at a slower pace than expected as the service side of the economy hits bottlenecks with sectors. We know the sector will benefit with reopenings and increased consumer confidence. Can anybody give us an idea what those what those bottlenecks are about? A lot of it is like the capacity. Some restaurants are open at 25% capacity. So there's only so much they can operate and so much. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. What about what about other parts of the economy like the, um, for example, uh, private manufacturing? We know that uh, uh, shipping has been disrupted. We know that supply chains have been disrupted, right? Mm -hmm. Which of course is gonna slow down hiring. If you look here, we see what the, ADP employment change uh, looks like monthly um, since the beginning of the, uh, since February of last year, which was uh, just prior to the onset of the, um, uh, this terrible pandemic. And you see that uh, except for um, May and June, the growth of jobs in, uh, in the private sector has been relatively weak, right? It has been, and therefore that's why um, there remains concern about that. Um, and we will keep a close eye on the uh, figures uh, coming out on Friday. And of course, we'll discuss those on Monday. Um, I think the expectation is, hold on a second, just bear with me. Um, the expectation is on Friday that the unemployment numbers should come in, that unemployment should hold steady at 6.3% and that non-farm payroll should be at 210,000. Last month, I'm pretty sure the numbers were right low, well below 50,000. Or just below 50,000. And so the expectation is that we should see a, a, a pretty strong number come Friday. This What's ADP that? employment report may suggest otherwise, but we're going to talk about that on Monday. Was there a comment there? Yeah. What's the reason for the increased expectation? Uh, the reason for the increased expectation is that um, the, uh, the, 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 the stimulus package and the, 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 um, uh, the vaccinations, that more businesses are hiring, more businesses are opening. Restaurants that had a zero capacity because they were closed now have at least 25 or 30 percent. And there are even states that are opening up. Well, they hadn't opened yet. Texas is a new uh, phenomenon having totally reopened. But your comment about uh, um, capacity um, holds true here in terms of why um, the expectation is, is that uh, the number would be so strong. Uh, bear in mind, a healthy economy should be producing 225 to 250,000 jobs a month. So a lot of the um, uh, low numbers that we've seen and huge numbers of um, jobless claims um, is a result of this anomalous time that we're living in um, with, the, with the pandemic. I'd like to move on here. Is that okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to go back to where we were uh, on Monday in terms of trade. I want to do a brief review on the evolution of trade theories that we make sure that we're all on the same page. We talked first about the mercantilists and we said that their wealth is fixed. It's a static view which discourages trade. And it says that a nation's wealth is measured by the amount of precious, precious metals that it holds and that a, a nation should, um, encourage, uh, should encourage exports but discourage its imports. Um, following that, we looked at five thinkers, five theorists, five economists who looked at trade very differently than the mercantilists. And the thinking of those five economists, theorists, um, statisticians is what forms the underpinning of classical trade and economic theory. David Hume was the guy who took on the mercantilists. And what he focused on was the mechanism of mercantilism, the idea that a nation should only uh, maintain trade surpluses. And what he addressed was the idea that that was, was 
what he addressed was the notion that that was not impossible, that that was not possible in the long run as a result of the price BC flow mechanism, which said that an inflow of gold and silver of precious metals is going to drive the value of currency, the, the nation's currency higher. That's going to lead, lead to increasing, going to lead to increasing imports and decreasing exports, which is going to do what? It's going to eliminate the trade surplus and trade and turn that into a deficit. Following him, we talked about Adam Smith, who really begins to talk about the importance of trade, he encourages trade. Um, he, however, looked at trade not based on comparative advantage, which is a modern notion. He looked at trade based on absolute advantages and said that trade, that the, he said that, <clears throat> excuse me, talked about the labor theory of value, the idea that labor was the only um, factor of production and that the, the cost of a good was entirely dependent upon the amount of labor that was used to produce it, okay? Um, he was followed in uh, the early 1800s by John Baptiste Say, who coins the idea that supply creates its own demand, which is a fundamental idea of classical economic and trade theory that the quantity demanded will always equal the, the quantity supplied and that full, full employment will be achieved on its own automatically and that any economy will operate its full potential automatically. This is Say's law. And uh, in simple terms, uh, that the government doesn't have to do anything. This has become a rallying cry for people who believe that in fact, smaller government is better than bigger government. And it's been something that we have been fighting about in this country um, for a very long time, but particularly since the creation of the New Deal um, under Roosevelt in the 1930s and the efforts to, over the course of the ensuing 90 years to dismantle it in one way or another. If as I'm going along, there are any comments or questions, please jump in. Next, we talked about David Ricardo, who revisits Adam Smith, and he looks at trade based on comparative advantages or relative efficiencies. What was the drawback here is that he doesn't talk about how the terms of trade are determined. He also relies on Smith's labor theory of value, which is labor is the only factor of production. It's not until the beginning of the next century that we find Hector Olin, who begins to talk about factor endowments, and we're going to talk about that next week. Finally, John Stuart Mill answers the question that Ricardo didn't as far as um, how are ter terms of trade determined. And what he said was that the terms of trade are based upon the reciprocity of demand, the intensity of one nation's, the, the intensity of one nation's demand for another nation's products, that that would determine the terms of trade. What was the point that he made about a large nation trading with a small nation? Does anybody remember? Yeah, like a small nation has an, an advantage over the, the the big one because the demand for f coming from the from the big nation is much bigger than the supply that the small nation has. So that means that yeah, there is um, there is an advantage from from the small country towards the, the bigger one. Does anybody have a thought about that? Is the advantage from from the small with the small? I, thank you, Alec. That was that was great. I agree with you, it's a question of advantages. I'm just not so sure it's in that direction. I think it, it, it's more likely that what he said was that um, the demand schedule of a large nation would overwhelm the demand schedule of a small nation. I'm pretty sure about that. Well, the, the, the small nation will end up being a price taker, right? The small nation will end up being a price taker. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Good point. Yes, folks. Alec has just introduced a concept that we'll come on, we'll address in a couple of se a couple of sessions down the uh, down the calendar. Um, uh, yes, in this case, the nation would be a price taker. Um, uh, is the U.S. usually a price taker or not? Not. No. No. That's exactly right. We're gonna we're gonna put that aside. Thank thanks, Alec. Um, so here's our classical economic uh, uh, um, uh, team. Uh, uh, um, followed by, uh, we talked about the first waves of globalization, new technologies, falling tariffs, large immigration flows, and labor mobility, where people could move from one place to another across an expanding nation. Um, uh, we said that 1914 sees the, the start of World War I, the end of which brings a new era of protectionism. And we talked about the Smoot-Holy Tariff Act in 19, 
30 that was established to protect the agricultural sector. Um, we also discussed the idea that Henry Ford uh, coined back in um, the early part of the 20th century during the industrial age, the ideas of stakeholder capitalism, that a company's success was tied to the welfare of its employees, much like the, the success of a nation is tied to the welfare of its citizens, which is what Keynes had argued um, in the 1930s to uh, uh, Roosevelt and in his, uh, um, uh, in his many theories. Um, following Henry Ford, we just identified the Great Depression years and the introduction of the social safety net that forms the basis of the social safety net that we all uh, continue to enjoy today. Um, uh, Keynes comes along, he challenges convention back in the 1930s and what is his big argument? He argued for the things that we could change as opposed to the things that we couldn't change because under classical economic theory, we couldn't change anything. The economy was going to do what it's going to do. Thankfully, the quantity demand will always equal the quantity supplied. What happens though if there's a disruption though to those trends? Well, that's what Keynes talked about when there's a disruption to the longer to, to those trends, which is what we saw during the Great Recession, during the Great Depression. So I point out here, he says increasing M1 via bank asset buying wouldn't be inflationary. The boom, not the bust, is the right time for austerity. Can someone remind us what is M1? Cash and coins. It's the, yes, Alec, thank you. It's the domestic monetary base, cash coins and their equivalents like traveler's checks. Very good. It's the domestic monetary base. Then we talk about the, we talked about the, the growth surge in 1945 to 1980. We see, um, we see huge growth in uh, the middle class, huge growth in um, uh, union membership um, peaking in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, actually, it, it, it peaked in 1970s. In the 1979, I think it peaked at 31 uh, to uh, peaked at the 21 million members. Anyway, uh, this post World War II growth surge um, was was supported by what institutions, trade alliances, and agreements. What type of agreements? Financial agreements. All of which has led to uh, or led to better living standards and to peace and harmony. Um, uh, better peace, more peace and harmony through liberalized trade, free trade. That's always been the objective of whether it was the general agreements on tariffs and trade back in 1947, which became the World Trade Organization um, in 1995. That's always been the idea, the, el the elimination of all trade barriers to lead to a more prosperous, uh, peaceful world. Um, uh, finally, we talked about the third wave of globalization that begins with information technology in the late 1960s followed by where we are today since the 1980s, we see the rise of agglomeration economies in a multipolar world where countries that were previously dependent upon other nations for their growth, countries like Brazil, Russia, India, China, are now uh, independent engines of growth on their own. So we have, um, as we said, a multipolar um, economic world order driven by things like outsourcing, worldwide specialization, uh, nanotechnology, broadband, um, and, uh, and the like. So um, this is a summary of all the work that we did the other day. It should provide you with a good um, review sheet. Are there any questions here? Yeah, what's the second wave of globalization? Uh, the first, the second wave of globalization is in between the period 1945 and 1980 during that post-World War II growth surge. As the US is growing and becoming a force of, um, uh, uh, for, uh, becoming a post-World War II, um, uh, um, in the post-World War II era, the US was the architect of global trade, the leader of international organizations. It was um, uh, becoming more and more of an instrument or more and more of a, um, a representative of democracy around the world, exercising um, uh, uh, the power it accumulated as a, following a victorious, uh, you know, a victory in World War II. Um, and the world was looking to the U.S. as a, as a, as a role model. Um, I think that I would say that that was the second wave of globalization as the U.S. Um, engages, endeavors to um, replicate or 
um, recreate its influence around the world to spread democracy, to spread the idea of free trade, of liberalized trade. Um, that's my um, answer to um, your question. Does that satisfy you? Yes, thank you. Okay, Professor. you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, so basic, basic, basically, uh, on the book it says that a bigger nation has less uh, advantages from the, tr from the trade than a smaller nation has. And uh, since the U.S. embarked in all these like trade policies and, and trying to bring the world together, uh, what do you think was the main, the main factor, economical factor, other than just spreading the peace and, uh, you know, democracy in the world that, that led because the U.S.? By, because, 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 well, it's a very good question. Why? Because by pursuing liberalized trade after world, by... by by establishing itself as an architect for a new world order. Um, the United States was able not only to strengthen the forces reform, which it has continued to do up until the Trump administration, which abandoned its role as a global leader, but um, gain uh, uh, hundreds of millions of consumers uh, or more for our goods and services. So we strengthened the forces reform and uh, we gain um, uh, hundreds of millions of consumers uh, for our goods and services, all the while um, uh, 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 driving higher living standards and uh, better access to education and health care for um, uh, disenfranchised and impoverished people around the world who have been lifted out of poverty, hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty since the end of World War II, um, as uh, the U.S. has um, uh, uh, um, supported free trade around the world and supported democratic movements. Um, Got it. Thank you. Does that make sense to you? Yes, you, you yes, know, yes, yeah. Yes. I, I mean, that's yes. th that's exactly what I think. Absolutely, strengthening the forces reform, get customers, drive higher living living standards. Yes. Okay. So, oh, professor, I have a question. Yeah, please so go ahead. Thing, I think I was trying to enunciate with in uh, the last time we went over this. So it says that uh, during the booms, like we, uh, is there? Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, so basically, you got to cut down when the economy is booming. So I think the point I was trying to make last time is that when we were booming, we had an easy money money policy. But the easy money but, policy, that's exactly right. It wasn't as easy as it was before. The Fed just can't stop. The Fed was stopping, but it was slowing down. So it's been slowing down, yeah. slowing down, slowing down. And over since the since the end of 2013. So it's slowing down, it's slowing down, it's slowing down. And then what happens? You get hit with this COVID disaster, and all of a sudden then you've got to ramp up your um, uh, your your open market transactions in order to continue to stimulate the economy, just like you're right back in uh, the okay. fall of 2008, the credit market sees Lehman Brothers goes belly up and we're off to the races. So um, uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, your question was a good one. Um, I think that it's the frame within which we look at um, what the Fed is doing. Um, and once they begin tapering, uh, they're, they're moving towards an end point, but that end point has to happen very gradually. Yeah. So for my my last like I think in my advanced uh, macro class my the teacher actually thought that uh, the economy was in a bubble and that we were very leveraged up and because we weren't we didn't have a, a fund for a rainy day because of all the easy money policy there's a lot of insolvency. In Ever the, since Basel three and the Dodd Frank bill, isn't the banking system much safer than it was in two thousand eight? Isn't uh, that a general consensus around the world among banking managers that are now undertaking a biannual, at least biannual uh, checks of the world's largest money center banks um, that exist within, uh, you know, that exist. Um, uh, I'm asking you the question, do you agree with me that the results of Basel III and uh, Dodd-Frank here in the United States and the Volcker rule have led to a stronger capital market system around the world, uh, much I, less? I can't give you a definitive answer because I am not knowledgeable enough in that area. Well, then consider a rhetorical yeah. question. Yes, the, the international banking system is much safer than it was um, 12 or 13 years ago as a result of the efforts being made by domestic and international um, bank regulators to strengthen uh, uh, the, 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 the international monetary system in the event that we run into another black swan event the way that we did before with subprime mortgages and now with, um, uh, of course, uh, the, the terrible COVID crisis. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on then. So, 
Uh, again, we're, we're looking a, a quick review of where we were the other day. We looked at uh, we looked at the U.S. and Canada producing wheat and cars in a very simple economy. We identified uh, the U.S. advantage in producing cars and the Canadian advantage in producing wheat. We also identified the marginal rates of transformation of one product, wheat, into cars, and said that the U.S. Um, we said that uh, again. Uh, the U.S. has an advantage in producing cars. Canada has a has an advantage in producing wheat, and therefore each should produce what they're good at and exchange. We said that after specialization, we showed that we showed production gains from specialization. Before then, we looked at consumption gains from trade. So first, there's autarky, which is uh, what the nation's production schedule looks like before trade, and then after specialization what their uh, production schedule looks like. And then of course, after trade, we see for both nations, there's a net gain following uh, specialization. Then we identified the terms of trade ratio on an exam, I would give you the terms of trade ratio, excuse me. We show that that designated the uh, trading possibilities line and went through the process of uh, uh, the, each nation moving along its trading possibilities line till it comes to a post-trade consumption point. So the U.S. we showed moving up its production uh, possibilities, its trading possibilities line from point B um, all the way to point C here, its post-trade consumption point, exporting 60 cars and importing 60 bushels of wheat at the same time that Canada is moving down its uh, uh, trading possibilities line, exporting 60 bushels of wheat and importing 60 cars. Um, we said that um, the trade triangle is bordered by a nation's imports, its exports, and the trading possibilities line or its terms of trade here. Okay. Again, we showed that after trade, there was a net gain, uh, a, a net gain, um, a net gain in consumption of 40 cars and 40 bushels of wheat. So on the whole, both nations are better off after specialization and after trade as opposed to autarky. Were there any questions here on this brief review? No? Okay, I'm gonna just step up for a second. I'll be right back. Pardon me, apologize. Thank you for your patience. I'm back. So let's talk about, <clears throat> let's talk about here, what did we do? We took the negatively slow production possibility schedule and they were converted into cost ratio lines. On an exam, I would give this to you. Those cost ratio lines become the no trade boundaries. It's the region between those, no, those cost ratio lines is the region of mutually beneficial trade. So here, domestic cost ratio set the outer bound limits um, and the region of mutually beneficial trade, as I just said. Are there any questions here? Again, a review of the work we looked at on Monday. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the commodity terms of trade or the barter terms of trade. And all of these is a ratio of the value of a nation's exports to its imports multiplied by 100. If its exports are greater than its imports, what does that mean? It means that the ratio is going to be greater than 100, and that's a nation that generally is running a surplus, like Australia. If it's less than, um, if it's less than 100, what does it mean? You have your, excuse me. You you importing more than what you exported. That's exactly right. If your imports are greater than your exports, more capital is going out to buy imports and coming in to buy exports than than going out than coming in from buying exports, which means that your country is running what? Deficit? A country is running a deficit. That's exactly right. So here is the international exchange ratio, also known as the commodity terms of trade, which we're going to add to our toolkit for the semester um, as we um, endeavor to become uh, better global managers. So it's the IER or commodity terms of trade. As we said, if it's less than 100, where your imports are greater than your exports, 
um, uh, like the United States, you have more capital going out to buy imports. If you're Australia, where your exports are greater than your imports, you have more capital coming in from exports. You have improving terms of trade, of course, when there's a rise in export prices relative to your import prices, and you have deteriorating terms of trade when you have a rise in import prices relative to your export prices. Very straightforward. Um, in fact, if we look here, we see between Switzerland, Canada, Argentina, Australia, we see the commodity terms of trade with exports greater than, greater than imports. Your IER commodity terms of trade is over 100 with more capital, indicating that more capital is coming in from exports than is going out to buy imports. And between Japan, Brazil, China, and the US, we see the condition of deficit where your imports are greater than your exports um, and that your what indicates that more capital is going out to buy imports. So on an exam, if I said to you the IER is less than 100, that means the country's running a deficit and more money's going out to buy imports. That's a, that's a sample question I might ask you on an exam. Does everybody understand this? Pretty straightforward concept. So the IER is another barometer that we use to gauge um, uh, um, a trade flows for any particular nation. And we look at country risk later on in the semester, we'll come back to the commodity terms of trade um, in our analysis. So again, any thoughts or comments, questions, observations here? I'm gonna say that as a, as, a, as a unanimous no. So let's talk about, yeah. Is a, can you go back to the last slide? Is China running a deficit? And is this like, so they're running a deficit in this? I didn't know that they were actually running a deficit in general. I thought they in had- In this analysis, when this was done, this is a couple of years ago, oh, China's okay. running a deficit. It's not from this year. It's not this year. Okay, okay but yes. You when it does, yes, China was running a deficit. So we've talked about static gains from uh, static gains from specialization, where we see just a reallocation of resources, right? Well, then of course there are dynamic gains of um, dynamic gains from trade, where we see the most efficient use of a economy's resources versus, as we said, the static effects of reallocating a certain quantity of resources, all of which leads to higher productivity and economic growth. So we know that economies that have large scale production ca capabilities can expand their production. They can afford to hire specialized labor and equipment, which again leads to increased efficiency and lower unit cost. We know that international trade brings increased competition. Why is increased competition good? Well, it creates dynamic gains and forces companies to fine tune their operating strategies in order to be competitive. If they don't do that, what happens? They go out of business. It seems to me that the same thing holds true for every area of modern life um, that compels uh, professionals, compel, compels companies, compels nations to be um, uh, uh, um, to fine tune their operating strategies um, in order to remain competitive in a modern economy. Um, so we know trade, we've said, generates both static gains from resource allocation and dynamic gains by stimulating economic growth. Okay. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of that. Okay. Here, we're gonna look at the US and Japan producing computers and cars. And we're gonna discuss what happens when comparative advantages change because comparative advantages don't always stay the same. The advantage that Japanese manufacturers had in the production of television sets um, hasn't remained consistent since um, the 1970s. It changes over time. Um, let's look here. We see that here, the U.S. marginal rate of transformation, cars into computers and computers into cars, is one. One unit for one unit. In Japan, the marginal rate of transformation into cars into computers is double that. It's two. And its conversion ratio of computers into cars is half of what it is in the United States. So that means that the US has a comparative advantage in the production of what, somebody? Computers. Has a comparative advantage in the production of computers, whereas Japan has a comparative uh, uh, advantage in the production of cars. 
That's exactly right. So the U.S. has a comparative advantage in car in PC production and a comparative disadvantage in car production. Okay. Next, what happens? Production increases in the U.S. Uh, um, PC production increases in the United States 50 percent and 300 percent in Japan. That changes the marginal rates of transformation. So you've got the same amount of resources being used, but you have different uh, comparative advantages being achieved. So what happens in the US? The US it becomes better at producing cars now. The US becomes better at producing cars than Japan. And what about in the production of computers? Um, Depends. Well, yeah, they have to give up on 0.67 car to make one computer compared to- Who has to lower 5. cost of production of cars, of computers? Uh, Japan has a lower Japan has cost. lower cost of production in computers and the US comparative advantage changes the China Japan loses its comparative advantage in the production of cars that's a gain for the United States so we see the productivity lags the US loses comparative advantage in the production of computers which Japan picks up but achieves a comparative advantage in the production of cars so you have a complete change in the direction of comparative advantages so a change in manufacturing productivity changes or triggers a change in the comparative advantage and a change in the direction of trade. I think that's very interesting because what it shows is it shows that advantages can be developed and if not maintained, they can be lost. Just the way that we've seen companies that did not remain competitive that are forced to declare bankruptcy, whether it was Polaroid or Kodak or uh, Schwinn, um, uh, uh, Borders bookstores that have not remained, these are some of the, you know, marquee names uh, that we've discussed, um, that have not remained competitive um, and have been forced to um, uh, declare bankruptcy. Um, it's no different in the real estate industry, which I'm in and uh, which I have some, uh, some business in, um, where you see people that over leverage. And then when things get tough, the way we're seeing right now with a major developer here in New York, um, uh, uh, the walls start closing in. You've over leveraged here, there, and everywhere, and all of a sudden everyone's knocking on your door. Um, a good lesson out of that is don't over leverage. I'm sure you've uh, uh, heard that before discussing your, your, your finance classes. Um, are there any questions on this slide? No? So we said patterns of advan comparative advantage change over time. Productivity increases as more output is produced with the same amount of resources. Then we see dynamic gains from shade, which show a more efficient use of resources higher productivity versus, again, the static effects uh, the static effects of reallocating a fixed amount of resources. We know that under constant cost conditions, specialization is complete, as we've seen before, where specialization is partial under increasing marginal rates of transformation. Why? Because there's increasing opportunity costs. So here, again, we go back to our original uh, uh, production possibility schedule, our concave production possibility schedule, which shows us that um, uh, factors of production are imperfect substitutes for one another. And so we see here, what is the production possibility schedule under increasing cost conditions? What cost conditions? Let's see what happens as comparative advantages change. So we know that they're increasing comp increasing opportunity costs at any point along the along the slope of the curve, we know that the marginal rate of transformation is going to be different. So here we see that at point A, the marginal rate of transformation is one car gets me one bushel of wheat. At point B, it shows me that one car costs me four bushels of wheat. So this is a nation that has a comparative advantage in the production of what? Cars. Um, is it cars? Well, down at this point, where should they be producing? Down at this point, it cost me four bushels of wheat to produce a car. Up here, it cost me one bushel of wheat to produce a car. Point so I'm going to be producing up here. I've got a. I've got a. I, I've got a um, advantage here. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Good. Very good. So let's take a look here at. Let's expand upon this example. 
Okay, so here we have the US producing wheat and cars. We see it's concave. We see it's concave production possibility schedule and two, two points um, that are tangent to the curve where of course we're gonna see different marginal rates of transformation. Here we see pre-specialization autarky at five cars and 18 bushels of wheat in the US. And we see that the marginal rate of transformation of cars into wheat is a third of a bushel of wheat gets me one car, okay? Here we see Canada at pre-specialization autarky, um, it's producing 17 cars and six bushels of wheat. The marginal rate of transformation here is one car gets me, is one car costs three bushels. The marginal rate of transformation for this line tangent to the curve is one car is three bushels of wheat. So which, who has the comparative advantage in the production of cars? The US, right. We know that cars are relatively cheaper to produce in the United States than Canada because it's flatter. It's uh, the curve, the line tangent to the curve is flatter than it is in Canada. The steeper the curve, um, the more expensive it becomes. So the relative cost of wheat into cars is indicated by the slope of the line TUS here, tangent to the production possibility schedule at point A we showed, and the slope of the line TC here, um, tangent to the, uh, the schedule at point A prime. If there are any questions as we go through, please, please jump in. So the law of comparative advantage says what? The US should export cars and Canada should export wheat. Yes? So the US is going to move along its production possibility schedule from point A to point B, where it is now at a post-specialization production point. So it's moved down its PPS from point A to point B at the same time that Canada is gonna move up its production possibility um, uh, schedule in the next slide. But again, the point here was relative cost of cars in terms of wheat increases indicated by the increasing slope of the schedule. So here it was a third of a bushel of wheat gets me one car. Now we see that the marginal rate of transformation, the opportunity cost is increasing because the steeper the line becomes um, the more expensive, the, the higher the opportunity cost. Now it's one bushel of wheat and one, one car costs us one bushel of wheat. Professor, so, I have a question. This is when you compare country to country. So in the real world, how do they uh, determine this? It, I'm like, sorry, what do you mean like, in the real so, world? We're just comparing country to country. Why does the US and Canada have a, have a reason to trade cars and wheat okay. with one another? Because one can produce more efficiently than the other. When the price differential is eliminated, then the reason for trade is eliminated, and therefore they can produce a mix of both, right? Yeah. So, okay. So here we see uh, again the production gains from specialization, and an increasing marginal rate transformation as the nation moves down its production possibility schedule. Here we're going to see the exact opposite. Well, the same thing, but in opposite direction. Canada is going to move up towards move up its its production possibility schedule to a post-specialization production point that shows us um, an increasing, oh, pardon me, that shows us an increasing, uh, uh, shows us a decreasing, pardon me, shows us a decreasing uh, marginal rate of transformation as the line tangent to the production possibility schedule becomes um, less steep, becomes flatter, okay? It goes from, Canada's ratio goes from one car is three bushels of wheat to one car equals one bushel of wheat, one bushel of wheat, where it arrives at its post specialization production point B prime. So, Professor, yeah, uh, I have a question. So basically, uh, in the beginning, we we have at point A for U.S. and point B for point A prime for Canada. This is where we are at autarky. So they are at autarky. So then they they start understanding that they have an advantage um, U.S. in autos and and uh, Canada and wheat after starting trade, and that's when they start shifting their production and their resources, right? That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly Impressive. right. Yep. Are the numbers on the tangents, are they approximated? The numbers on the tangents are approximated, yes. 
Uh, I was just making sure because I saw one auto equals 0.33 weight, and I was just wanted to make sure that was you're, from sure, the you're, you're looking at 18 over five. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes, that's the answer. Yes, I know that's a little confusing. Thank you. Um, uh, but yes, that's that's uh, both a good question, and uh, I hope that, that my answer clarifies it. So we looked at production gains with specialization, and we we're going to look at the data now the way that we did on Monday, and we see before specialization, this is where the U.S. and Canada is. After specialization, U.S. is producing seven more cars. Canada is producing seven more bushels of wheat. We see a net gain of, uh, for the world of three, uh, three and three cars and bushels of wheat, respectively. And we see, again, these are the static gains of specialization as resources have been reallocated. And each nation is going to produce based upon its comparative advantage, either in the production of cars for the U.S. or in the production of wheat for Canada. If we move on from here, what do we see? We know that each nation can choose a consumption point along its trading possibilities line. So the post-trade consumption point is at point C here in the United States, right? Because its trading possibilities line has moved from here to here. It's going to choose a point here along its trading possibilities line and going to consume here, just as Canada is going to consume at C prime here. It's favorable to both nations because the terms of trade, it's steeper in the US than it was before, remember it was flat, and it's uh, flatter uh, in uh, Canada, the curve is flatter in Canada than it was when we began, um, uh, when, when we began after a specialization. Okay, so from here. So point C is after that, exchanges happen, right? Right. This is the trade. This is where they're going to trade, and both nations are going to continue to consume exactly the same amount that they consumed before they um, uh, before they engage before they began trading. So the U.S. is going to produce its post-trade consumption point is here. It's still consuming five cars. What about the twelve cars it's producing? What happened to them? They're they're giving them to Canada. That's right. They're giving them to Canada. And Canada is going to continue to consume six bushels of wheat, but it's producing a 13. What's it going to do with these seven? Those are the seven that gives to us from 14 Exports to 21. Exports to the United States. That's 100% right. Thank you very much. So we know, as I said before, the specialization will continue until the relative cost of cars is identical in both nations. U.S. car exports equals uh, Canada's imports and Canada's wheat exports equals the U.S. wheat imports. So the domestic rates of transformation converge at the rate given by the line TT, which is our terms of trade or trading possibilities line. That becomes the international terms of trade line for both nations here and here. Okay, so we say that after trade, the car consumption has stayed constant in the United States and wheat consumption has stayed constant in Canada, okay? So we're at point D. That allows us to define our uh, a trade triangle. Yes, because we show what? We have the US exports become imports in Canada, you see? Exports of wheat, because they're consuming six, they're exporting seven bushels of wheat here, look over here, become the imports in the United States. And we see the terms of trade line in both nations gives us our trade triangle. Does everybody see that? I take that as a silent but unanimous yes. Okay. Any questions before I move further, folks? Okay. Did you do you mind just going over one more time? What what was the what did what did this mean when it gets to th this triangle? Sure. Okay. Thank you. So here we are at Otarki. Both nations specialize. The U.S. moves down its curve, specializes here. Canada moves up its curve and and specializes here, right? Mm -hmm. Then both nations, uh, their marginal rates of transformation change and you see those two marginal rates of transformation become exactly the same. 
those become the, uh, uh, the international terms of trade line for both nations, the trading possibility line for both nations. Okay, so now we showed um, the uh, static gains to specialization. We show that post trade consumption for both nations is taking place at C and C prime, respectively, because the US went from autarky down to its post specialization production point, and it's going to move up its trading possibilities line and its post trade consumption point it chooses here, right? Where it's consuming 21 bushels of wheat and five cars, exporting seven bushels, seven cars, and importing seven uh, bushels of wheat. Here in Canada, Canada is um, uh, uh, at autarky here. After autarky, it moves here to B prime. After trade, it's moved down its trading possibilities line here to C prime, where it, 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 it is consuming six bushels of wheat and 20 cars, having imported um, from the United States seven cars and exported seven cars to um, uh, ex export seven bushels of wheat into the United States. So D becomes our, uh, 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 our final point that we have to identify here. That gives us the, the borders for our trade triangle. That's indicated by exports in the United States become imports in Canada. Canadian exports of wheat become uh, uh, US exports of wheat here exports of wheat in the United, imports of wheat in the United States, pardon me. And then of course we have the terms of trade. How's that? A little bit more clear. Okay, good. So we see that again, after trade, both nations are where they were before trade in terms of their consumption. But overall, we see consumption gains from trade. So consumption gains from trade are made as mo more of each good is being produced. Yes? Okay. So from here, I'd like to talk about a couple of things with regard to global supply chains. We know that Smith relies on, uh, uh, um, uh, pardon me, Dave Ricardo relied on Smith's labor theory of value. But what do we know? We know that there are multiple factors of production, labor, technology, capitals, and ideas that move around the globe now in the modern age um, on 24 our seven day a week cycles. Professor, can I ask you a question about that? Um, I know that like we know now there are a lot more inputs besides labor, but how is that not obvious then? How is it not obvious back in the, the you mean, uh, back in the 1700s? Why was it not obvious that the only uh, uh, factor, the only factor of production was labor? Um, because you weren't as smart then as we are now. The word is yeah, the very, there's raw materials, there's natural natural resources. How did they not right. factor that in? Well, in Adam Smith's model of global trade, labor was the only factor of production that needed to be considered. It wasn't until the 1920s and Hector Olin uh, came up with the factor endowment theory, which looked at multiple factors of production. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you on that, but I don't at the moment. Um, if you let me move on, we'll revisit that in our next session. Is that okay? Yeah, thanks. Okay, okay. That's my 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 off the you know back of the envelope answer that um, it, it may not seem sufficient, but uh, uh, what Adam Smith did, um, uh, what Adam Smith said, and David Hume before him um, was considered uh, really revolutionary because it challenged what was um, existing or prevailing uh, consensus thinking on trade and economics over three hundred years, um, and uh, trade. Um, it was very much informed by the uh, amount of labor that a nation could control. A lot of that labor was uh, slave labor, um, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, moving off of that uh, point, let's, let, let's get back here to global supply chains. We know that there are multiple factors of production. We know that competitive, competitive de depends upon more than labor productivity and wage levels. There's product quality, trade patterns, which we discussed, tra changing trade patterns, production and distribution costs. We know that the nation specializes partially in the production of goods where it has a comparative advantage. We also know that not all goods and services are traded internationally. And so different consumers' tastes taste cause partial specialization. 
That's why you might see a different type of Nike sneaker when you're traveling in Europe and you'd see here because there are different tastes. Um, uh, if you go into a McDonald's in France, it's not gonna look like a McDonald's in Times Square because that McDonald's has been outfitted and tailored to fit the consumer tastes of whatever region it is in France. Uh, much like uh, the McDonald's that you would see in Ireland or the UK, um, that's something that, the, that McDonald's has been doing for years, tailoring their franchises to the uh, particular region that they're in. Um, we know that once cost differences are eliminated, as we saw before between Canada and the United States, the basis for specialization ends and both nations are going to produce more of each good or at least some of each good. Finally, we say that open trading systems channel uh, resources from low to high productivity and the competition forces high cost inefficient producers to exit, uh, much as we said that competition forces um, uh, businesses to fine tune their operating strategies in order to remain competitive in a global marketplace. Um, I wanna talk about exit barriers, which uh, cause companies to delay their closings when their profits are subnormal, there's some type of overcapacity. When high exit costs exist, what it does is it stops naturally occurring market adjustments to take place via comparative advantage. That's a that's a wordy way that uses a lot of words to say a simple thing, which is what? That it's very hard to um, get out of a business when you have high exit costs, whether those exit costs are a plant that's too antiquated to be sold, it cannot be redeployed to do something else. You might have high pension costs. Um, uh, if you look at the steel industry, it's a very good example of, a, of an industry with very high um, exit barriers whether it was overcapacity in the industry, cheap imports coming from abroad, a fall off in demand for domestic steel competing with cheap imports, new technology that increased output with less labor, which is what you had a lot of here in the United States, steel labor, as I said, antiquated plants with no alternative use, your uh, contract termination costs where you have high fixed union negotiated wages and benefits. That makes it very hard to extricate yourself from a business, which is what the steel industry face. You might look at US steel or Bethlehem steel if you're looking to do some research on that. For examples of um, uh, once giant American companies that face enormous uh, exit barriers when they were trying to uh, um, reorganize and exit the business. And finally, of course, environmental problems make it hard to exit the business when there are long term, uh, when there's long term damage that needs to be addressed and paid for uh, by the company itself. Are there any questions here? Okay. Well then let's move on. What is this? Anyone know what this is? Looks like an engine. It is an engine. Does anyone know which engine? It's like an airplane engine. Okay, no. Look something from Charlie Chaplin's movies. Uh, that's good, Charlie Chaplin. Well, it's not that far off. It comes from the same era, it's the Model T. It's the Model T Ford, which is the first mass produced vehicle. So it had about 700 parts. We're talking the early 1900s. What did we see with the Ford plant? There was a high degree of labor specialization and a lot of vertical integration where everything could be produced in one factory, right? So you had large scale mass production in a single factory. Well, what happened though? What happened though is that consumers became what? They became wealthier and they became demanding, meaning that Ford had to do what? Produce more vehicles, produce a range of vehicles, different types of vehicles, right? And so as they become wealthier and more sophisticated, Ford could no longer produce efficiently in a single plant to meet its demand. And they began outsourcing their production, yes? Today, we know that 70% of Ford vehicle and parts and components are purchased from external suppliers, many of them from outside the United States. This, of course, is textbook definition of decentralized manufacturing we've been talking about since our very first day of class. So we know that increased specialization and outsourcing allowed Ford to recreate, refine, and expand its business model globally um, uh, uh, over the course of the last uh, number of decades. We talked about Apple before, but just to revisit it, we know that Apple made all of its products in the United States until the very late 1990s. 
a switch to foreign manufacturing to tap Asia's um, uh, pool of less expensive skilled and semi-skilled labor, allowing for easier to maintain supply chain networks for parts and components. We know that today global supply chains and production networks allow firms to move goods and services efficiently across borders. And I point out, as we have before, the US auto industry, the iPhone economy, and then all of the other um, uh, um, skilled uh, uh, services that we are, we are increasingly outsourcing, whether it's accounting or data analysis or software design um, that has um, uh, uh, found ready markets around the world. Um, okay, are there any questions here? Okay. We've got about eight minutes left and I want to talk about briefly reshoring, which we visited, we revisit, we revisited before when we looked at the yuan. And what did we say? We said that uh, with a with a we said that the dollar as the as the as the yuan strengthened between 2005 and 2013. So the dollar is buying fewer and fewer. Um, renminbi, U, Chinese yuan, we saw we see compressed margins. So if the yuan becomes 10% more valuable, that means that your business is 10% less profitable because you've got to pay 10% more in yuan terms. And so we saw, we talked about with regards to the television industry, some reshoring, some repatriation of um, uh, uh, domestic television production here as the U.S. became more competitive relative to the Chinese manufacturing market. So um, when we talk about reshoring and returning production to the United States, what's the emphasis on? It's on, of course, cheaper labor costs, um, cheaper labor costs relative to the labor costs in China um, under a strengthening yuan. Um, and of course, um, reshoring helps address supply chain disruptions. If all of your production is here in the United States, um, or, or the majority of it is, that can help um, erase some of those supply chain concerns. We've discussed that with BMW, which has set up a, you know, enormous plant um, in Spartanburg, South Carolina since 1995 and helps them not only erase foreign exchange risk, but also to eliminate a good deal of supply chain disruption risk. Um, I point out here that logistic costs have increased sharply over the course of last year as a result of the COVID recession, pardon me. And finally, that things like natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, geopolitical shocks like a war or an oil crisis, and black swan events like um, uh, the Great Recession, the housing crisis, the subprime mortgage crisis, 9-11 terrorist attacks, the COVID um, crisis, all of these things um, disrupt global supply chains. The question is, is how deeply and for how long and what role is the government and central banks, uh, what role do governments and central banks have to play in um, addressing uh, those downturns when they happen, addressing those crises when they happen. Um, in terms of reshoring, there was an interesting bit of news today. Walmart announced that it's going to invest $350 billion over the course of the next 10 years in U.S.-made products, whether they're made, grown, or assembled in the United States, with the expectation that they're going to create upwards of three-quarters of a million new jobs in textiles, plastics, appliances, food processing, pharmaceuticals, and medical supplies. I don't know if any of you read that, but on the concept of um, reshoring, I couldn't think of a better example of a, 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 a marquee U.S. company that is doing exactly that. Um, are there any comments or questions here? No. Okay. So I have a hedging module to go through with you, um, but. I think what I'm going to do in our remaining couple of minutes, um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this for you tonight. I'm going to post this problem for you tonight, and I'm going to ask you, and along with uh, that, along with completing Chapter Two homework in Carbo, specific attention played to problem number twelve, which is a mapping problem we're going to do in class next week. I'll post the answers to Chapter Two on Monday encouraging you to do the work on yourselves beforehand. I will post um, uh, the slideshow this evening. Rather than go through these two problems, I think it's two or three problems, hedging problems. I'm going to post them for you on the slideshow and ask that you complete them yourselves over the weekend. Again, along with uh, chapter two, question 12, we'll go over these, we'll go over these several hedging problems on Monday. Um, and beyond that, I want to 
I, I want to thank you all for your attention tonight. I wish you a good, safe continuation of your evening, your week, and uh, stay in touch as needed. I know I still have a couple of emails to respond to. I will get to that by the end of the week. And uh, 